I want to thank you personally for coming. My name is Bruce King. I'm Vice President for Equity and Inclusion here at the University. I'm here on behalf of our president, who was unable to be here this afternoon, to welcome you to the Johnson Lecture, which is one of four intercultural lectures that we sponsor every year. And I'm just glad that you're able to join us this afternoon for what promises to be an incredible conversation uh, with our guest from the Illinois Equality uh, Movement here in uh, Illinois. Uh, one of the things that, as someone still fairly new to Elmhurst, one of the things that attracted me was the work and teachings of the theologian Niebuhr, who is also a former president. Uh, and, uh, oh, no. Do I start over or? OK. Can, is this better? And everybody was just smiling and looking. And no one said, I can't hear you, right? So, so much for transparency and honesty. Um, hi, again, Bruce King, Vice President for Equity and Inclusion. I'm here on behalf of the president, who was not able to be here, to welcome you to this lecture, uh, the Johnson Lecture, which is a part of a four-part intercultural lecture series. Today, we're pleased to have our guests coming to us from Illinois Equality, Illinois Equity, uh, which is an organization that is advocating for the LGBTQIA plus community throughout the state and country. My experience with Illinois Equality came through the marriage amendment, which happened a few years ago. I uh, was an advocate, an ally for marriage, and I was so moved by the work of Illinois Equity um, in that movement, they played a crucial role in not only you know moving that legislation forward in Illinois, uh, even against odds. You know, the first round it didn't go well, <laughs> and brought it back. So I'm very pleased to be that to to have this conversation happening today. The beautiful thing about at Elmhurst University is that we support and believe and base a lot of our mission around the ever-widening circle. And as we think about this circle, and as we think about the lecture today, it is incre I am incredibly proud to be a part of an organization that makes sure that everyone finds their self in this circle. And I hope that you will find something that speaks to you today in this lecture and in future lectures, uh, and that you will continue to support uh, voices that represent identities that are all gathered here at Elmhurst University. Without further ado, I am going to invite our chaplain, the Reverend Scott Matheny, up to tell you a little bit about why we call this the Johnson Lecture and the history of our friend, Bill Johnson. Happy, happy National Coming Out Day. Come on, you can do this. Happy National Coming Out Day. <laughs> Good, yes. Let me introduce you to a snot-nosed young boy who came here at 17, almost 18, from a little teeny church in a little teeny town in this godforsaken state called Texas, off in some other part of the foreign world. And he lands at this institution not sure who he is, like, well, he, he knew he was gay. He knew he was gay way back. But Bill shows up and he does like a lot of young gay men here at this institution, he goes downtown to Chicago to the bars and has an amazing life here. He sings in the choir, he takes an academic track that is solid, and he graduates in 1968. He's out of the church, United Church of Christ, and he decides that he's gonna to go to seminary. He's not sure if he's gonna get ordained, but he goes to seminary out in San Francisco at a prominent institution, Pacific School of Religion. He gets through that program in 1972 and gets ordained, and he is the first person ordained openly gay in the church. United Church of Christ, and as Bill likes to elaborate, in Western civilization. 
And he has quite a trajectory. He can't get work. He cannot get a job. He ping-pongs around the nation, helping other young people come out, try to find their place in the church. He lands in New York, and he's working with a number of different groups, and AIDS breaks, and he becomes the backbone nationally of the AIDS work, both through the church and through the higher structures of health care. He founds the first organization for Christians that are gay at the Riverside Church in New York City, Maranatha. This is way ahead. So when I called him two nights ago to say, Bill, I want you to write something that I can read on your behalf for this community, he asked about the student group. He asked about the speaker because he exchanged emails. He asked about the faculty, the climate, because he loves this place. He bleeds blue. He is one of the most loyal alums. And this is what he wrote for you, for us. And I'm told I have to say it correctly, meme. I, Bill writes, I recently saw a meme on social media that reminded me of an uncomfortable truth. Since I was a teenager, people have threatened my freedom. Through countless acts of Congress, ballot initiatives, city councils, state legislatures, etc., my rights and the rights of all LGBTQ plus people has constantly been threatened. Every time I vote, Someone somewhere is trying to undo the progress we as a people have made to secure our rights. I believe we are all traumatized by this reality, if not consciously, then certainly subconsciously. If it weren't for my connection to our LGBTQ plus community, now as a gay elder, I would be in despair. Sounds strange. But I've learned the greatest threat to our freedom is indifference, mine and yours. Indifference, failure to care for one another. We must stay connected. We must organize. It will be our refuge. For, for clearly, the worst is yet to come. Bill Johnson, he, him, ours openly gay man, 1970. He was not out when he graduated from this place. And he would ask, come on Elmhurst, you can do it, you can be better. And when I told him that there is an Elmhurst Pride Collective in the city of Elmhurst that's putting on work, and Stephanie is here as the president from that great organization of the city of Elmhurst, he cheers because he loves this place, and he loves you, and he cares. And so with that, we have put a plaque up in 2011 commemorating him on the back side of the wall there as you're going down. You should take a look at it. It's when this lecture was inaugurated with his name, 2011. And for the joy of this time, I have the pleasure of bringing up one of our fabulous faculty. Dr. Josh, come on up, sir. And join me in welcoming him here. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Josh Van Arsdell. I'm an associate professor in our psychology department here, uh, and also a proud member of our vibrant LGBTQ plus community here at Elmhurst. Today we're in the esteemed company of Mr. Michael Leary, uh, the driving force behind Equality Illinois' advocacy as its director of public policy. With nearly a decade at the helm, Mike has been an indefatigable voice for the LGBTQ plus community across the state. His commendable tenure in the Illinois state government, especially as the director of legislative affairs for the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, showcases his dedication to this public service. Significantly, as a testament to his resilience and courage, Mike has also etched his name in history as the first uh, openly gay elected official in Sangamon County, uh, his home county. Uh, over lunch today, Mike shared some of his favorite initiatives that Equality Illinois has pursued. 
Uh, these included the push in 2019 to integrate LGBTQ plus contributions into state and U.S. history curriculums across the state, and the 2021 effort to instate in comprehensive, inclusive sexual health education standards. As an educator myself in the psychology of human sexuality, uh, I've seen firsthand the lingering myths that persist about the LGBTQ plus community and about sexual health in general. Thus, Mike's relentless dedication to counteracting misinformation, promoting understanding is not only commendable, but crucial, right? And this is, you know, in addition to all of the other wonderful, fabulous legislative work and policy uh, that uh, Equality Illinois is pursuing. Um, so through all of these endeavors, Illinois is steadily transforming into a more inclusive and empowering state, not only for LGBTQ plus folks, but for everyone. So now, let's dive into this enriching session to hear more about the great work Michael and his organization are up to. Please join me in giving a warm Elmhurst University welcome to Mr. Michael uh, Ziri. Hello, everyone. Oh, I should lean in. Happy National Coming Out Day, everyone. And as, as, as stated, um, let me lower this a little bit so I can see everybody. Mike Ziri, I'm the Director of Public Policy at Equality Illinois. We are the state's LGBTQ plus civil rights organization. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, and I just want to say I'm honored to be up here, to be invited by Elmhurst University to, to provide this lecture, uh, and really want to, to thank Reverend Dr. Johnson for his leadership and legacy um, and, and the, the role model for members of this university and for folks like me to, to follow in that footsteps uh, and the great work um, he did and is continuing to do. Also, it's October. Happy LGBTQ plus history month. Um, so I'm really excited about this month, um, particularly because, as was mentioned, the piece of legislation from a few years ago about teaching LGBTQ history in schools in Illinois. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but it just, this month really excites me. We all recognize June as Pride Month, but as a, as a history you know, undergrad major, I love this month um, because I love learning more about the vibrant, rich community, the history, the examples, the lessons, you know, um, it, stories that go before Stonewall in 1969 um, and the, 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 just the great trailblazers who came before us all. Um, so I want to get started. Um, so we at Equality Illinois, like I said, we're the state's LGBTQ plus civil rights organization. I'm the policy director. It's just a fancy way of saying I get to go to Springfield and I get to tell our legislative friends and some not friends why they should support proposals to keep this state moving forward and to continue to support and affirm LGBTQ plus people who live here and increasingly LGBTQ plus folks and families who are coming to Illinois because we are a supportive and affirming state. Um, so I spend a lot of time in Springfield, um, especially from January through May, um, working with the legislature. Um, and on, at that point, I, I was remiss. I do want to give two shout outs real quick. One, um, Stephanie, you've already been shouted out, but I want to recognize Stephanie and the Elmhurst Pride Collective, one of our great partners. We've worked together before, uh, and I was just reminded that we need to show up next year at Elmhurst Pride Festival as well. We haven't done that yet, so we will, um, but thank you for your partnership and the work you're doing in this community. Um, and then I also want to recognize State Representative Jen Ladish Douglas, uh, who has been just an amazing champion in her time in the legislature, supporting so many great proposals that keep this state moving forward. Um, even in a state like Illinois, you know, nothing is assured passage in the legislature without hard work and good, good allies and champions. So thank you so much for, for your, your, your leadership, your role model, and for being here today. You know? um, so one of my roles at Equality Illinois is to be present and to be the voice of LGBTQ plus folks in the state capitol. And that means I listen to a lot of stories across the state, stories of hope, stories of optimism, stories of, of pain and harm. Um, and I take those stories with me when I go into the halls of the Capitol and I talk to legislators about initiatives and proposals. Um, I've been with Equality Illinois now for about nine years, nine years in January. Um, and two, two little quips I remember from my first year, first-ish year at Equality Illinois that really highlight, I think, how far we've come 
both at Equality Illinois and in Illinois, but also nationally. Um, the first was shortly after June of 2015, when the Supreme Court decided the Obergefell National Marriage Equality case, um, we had folks asking me, well, what's left to fight for? You just won it all. You got it all. Aren't you finished? And that has stuck with me, particularly because some organizations, there was a pride group, uh, there was the uh, New York LGBTQ group, actually closed its doors after national marriage equality and said mission accomplished, when clearly we see mission not accomplished and the rights that we thought we had achieved are, are very much in peril now. The other, the other quip that really highlights some work that we've done the past nine years to build a true statewide presence and a statewide voice for LGBTQ plus folks is um, I remember lobbying a legislator, not from Chicago, and it was probably about the conversion therapy ban or some other bill from 2015, I don't remember specifically, and the legislator said, that's a Chicago issue, there are no gay people in my district. Mission accepted. Um, you, I promise you shortly thereafter that legislator heard from LGBTQ plus constituents. And I, I tell that because LGBTQ plus folks are everywhere, everywhere. Not just Chicago, not just Elmhurst, but everywhere across the state. I grew up in Springfield. We are everywhere, every town, every community, every county, everywhere. And LGBTQ plus issues and legislation are Illinois issues and legislation. So that, that I remember those quips because it, it, it still guides my thoughts that, you know, we need to make sure we as Equality Illinois need to help advocates across the state exercise their voice to their legislators um, and demonstrate that queer people are everywhere. And so those just, man, those, this, those quips have kind of stuck with me. Because A, the work is not finished, and we're gonna, I'll go through and talk about some of that. And B, there are queer people everywhere, and queer people are exercising their voice everywhere. Um, at lunch today, I said that I'm an eternally optimistic person. And I know there's a lot of scary stuff happening right now across the country, um, even in Illinois. But I'm optimistic because of the people that I meet every day that I get to work with, I see their resilience, I see them organized in their communities, and it, it excites me. And it makes me just very, very hopeful for, for the work yet to come. And so on that note, I'm actually gonna turn to a not hopeful topic, uh, and that is what's happening nationally. Um, 2023, uh, in terms of anti-LGBTQ plus policies has been the worst year on record. More than 400 anti-LGBTQ plus bills have been introduced in state capitals across the country, including a few in Illinois. Um, but in other states, those bills actually advance and pass and get signed into law. Um, and so over 400 bills. We also see what the Supreme Court is doing, you know, overturning the Dobbs decision last year. Um, you know, opening the door for a, a license to discriminate um, and, and allowing, you know, bad actors to, to use Supreme Court decisions to expand their rights to discriminate. And so we see what the, the, the courts are doing. We see what's happening in states across the country. And it's just more incumbent than why Illinois must keep moving forward. And on the Dobbs decision, one of the things, and we at Equality Illinois recognize this, but um, we did have to talk to folks about this, but LGBTQ plus rights are reproductive rights. In fact, there are no LGBTQ plus legal rights without the right to bodily autonomy and the right to privacy that also was the foundation of Roe v. Wade. Legally, they're the same concepts. And so when you strike, when the court strikes at reproductive rights, at the right to an abortion, they are gonna strike at the rights of LGBTQ plus people. And none other than Clarence Thomas, Justice Thomas said that in his concurring opinion. And you see it there, in future cases, we should consider all of this court's due process precedents, including Griswold, which is the right to contraception. Lawrence, Lawrence v. Texas, which decriminalized same-sex relationships across the country. 
and Obergefell, which was the national marriage equality decision. They're already saying, these opponents of equality are already mapping out where they want to go now after the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe v. Wade. And it's clear they're coming for LGBTQ plus people. And I believe them. I believe them, which is why Illinois, we keep pushing the ball forward. But so many protections are part of bodily autonomy and privacy. Interracial marriage, the right to contraception, the right to abortion, bodily autonomy, all of these issues are connected legally, uh, which is why we fight for bodily autonomy and we fight strongly with our partners. Um, but this, what is happening nationally is really emphasizing what we're doing in Illinois. And I wanted to also highlight what we're seeing, it's, you know, the same folks who are coming after the right to an abortion and the right to reproductive health care are also coming after trans youth. You see that here with this map. This state, these in the brown are states, 21 states, that have banned gender-affirming care, best practice gender-affirming care for trans youth. 21 states. In the face of all testimony and evidence from major medical organizations like the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics, these states have banned life-affirming, life-saving, gender-affirming care for trans young people. And as you can see, Illinois is mostly surrounded by these states, mostly surrounded. But what you also see um, in some states is you see a little shield. And that's because those states have passed laws called shield laws or refugee laws, refuge laws, that, allow, that, that protect folks who are coming to that state for health care. There are folks coming to Illinois to seek access to gender-affirming health care. And these shield laws, including the one in Illinois, protect them from the long arm of their home state seeking to criminalize their access to health care that is legal and appropriate and medically necessary here in the state of Illinois. Um, but these states around us, Iowa, Missouri, Indiana, Kentucky, all of them, we are seeing folks come to Illinois seeking health care. I also want to show you, this is a map of states that have, have imposed some form of restrictions on access to abortion since Roe fell. And you see Illinois, once again, in the middle of the country, as what I consider the anchor of equality in the country, being a place of refuge and safe haven, um, to a point where, for those individuals seeking an abortion from Florida, the closest place to go is Carbondale in southern Illinois. Um, and so it's so important that we keep providing protections. And just to, to emphasize this, I wanted to put the two maps next to each other um, to illustrate that the same folks coming after abortion are the same folks coming after gender-affirming care and vice versa. You could almost lay these maps on top of each other and they'd be the same. And again, you see Illinois right there in the middle of the country being a safe haven and a, a place of support and affirmation. Um, and we have heard um, from countless folks, we at, we at Equality Illinois, we attend a lot of pride festivals, and there's a lot of pride festivals that are happening now in the state of Illinois, like just an exponential growth of festivals everywhere, you know, from Chicago to Carbondale to Elmhurst to uh, Champaign-Urbana to Quincy, Illinois on the Mississippi River. And at each of those festivals, without, a, without a missing a beat, there, is some, there are some folks who come up to us and say, we just moved from Florida. We just moved from Texas. We just moved from Missouri. And we are so glad to live here because this is a state that welcomes and affirm us, affirms us. Um, and as, as we'll discuss, that didn't just happen by chance. Those laws and our, our affirming policies don't just happen by chance. Uh, it takes work and organizing and advocacy. But I always want to make the point, LGBTQ plus rights are reproductive rights. The two are intertwined. and legally cannot be separated. And that while all that's happening, what we're also witnessing is a severe increase, a serious increase in hate crimes, hate incidents. Um, there was just a report issued last week by the Anti-Defamation League, Hate in the Prairie State, ex, you know, detailing the growth and increase of anti-LGBTQ incidents, anti-Semitic incidents, um, and hate incidents across the state. And, and what that means, what that looks like. Um, you know, after Florida passed the Don't Say LGBTQ Plus bill, online hate surged 400%, 400%. And 
what happens online, that hate doesn't stay online. It becomes issues like the vandalism at the Uprising Bakery in McHenry County last summer, where the bakery was going to host a drag show and um, uh, uh, individual affiliated with the Proud Boys attacked the bakery, vandalized it, smashed the windows, and wrote anti-LGBTQ slurs on the side of the building. Um, so these incidents are happening, they're happening in Illinois, and while hate is not an Illinois value, we're not immune from this increase. But we also are a state that has been a leader on LGBTQ plus equality. Two examples, and it is LGBTQ History Month, so I love sharing these. Illinois is home to the first gay rights organization in the United States in 1924, the Society for Human Rights was formed on the north side of Chicago. It lasted for one year before the Postal Service shut it down, but we, are, we have that legacy. And we are also the first state in 1961 to decriminalize same-sex relationships. We are the first state to decriminalize same-sex relationships, 1961. So just two examples of the, you know, the rich legacy of Illinois. I, I think folks sometimes think when they think of LGBTQ plus history, they think of San Francisco they think of New York, but Illinois has a rich, rich history of, 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 you know, of queer engagement um, and, and involvement from folks like Jane Addams, the mother of social work, to uh, many others. And then over the last decade, Illinois has continued to set the stage for what it means to be LGBTQ plus inclusive, to be what I call the anchor of equality in the Midwest. And so we, have worked on and in coalition because none of this happens alone. None of this happens just because of me. None of this happens just because of Equality Illinois. Really exciting initiatives that have passed the legislature. We are the second state to fully repeal a law that criminalized HIV in the state of Illinois. And this is only two years ago. We only were able to do this two years ago, but a, a law that was on the books for 20, 25 years or so, a law that criminalized HIV, directly contrary to good public health policy. Um, we are a state that was one of the first to ban conversion therapy back in 2015. We are a state that uh, has established through law inclusive spaces, single occupancy, gender neutral restrooms, um, which I'm told you have some on campus. So that's awesome and I love that. Um, I never thought I would dig into bathroom policy as much as I have over the last few years, but it's so, it's so important to making inclusive spaces. You know, legislation to support LGBTQ plus older adults. Many LGBTQ plus older adults, you know, the individuals who built the foundation of the world that we live in, the rights we have, many LGBTQ older adults who move into nursing homes go back in the closet because those facilities are not welcoming and affirming to them. And so we've worked with partners like AARP Illinois and SAGE and other groups to, to pass you know, enhancements to Illinois law, to create the first ever state commission on LGBTQ plus aging, to, to require trainings for providers of aging services in the aging network, um, and the first state to designate people living with HIV, older adults living with HIV, as a community of greatest social need when it comes to building programming that's inclusive of older adults. Um, we also, uh, one bill that, as you heard, I'm really partial to because I'm really excited about what it, what it means for health and safety. We worked in coalition two years ago to pass legislation modernizing and creating new learning standards for personal health and safety education and sexual health education in Illinois. Trust me, the old standards were deeply stigmatizing to parenting youth, to sexually active youth, and even included language that if a school taught sexual health education, they would have to teach honor and respect for heterosexual monogamous marriage. This was in the school code until two years ago, 10 years after marriage equality. So we're really proud to get rid of those old standards and put in place new age appropriate, medically accurate, inclusive learning standards for personal health and safety education and sexual health education. But we're not done with that work yet. And I'll come back to that in a second. But this year also is a big, big highlight. And uh, Bruce mentioned it a little bit ago. 
But this year is the 10 year anniversary of marriage equality, the bill passing the Illinois General Assembly. 10 years ago next month, Illinois adopted marriage equality. Um, and we are the last state to pass marriage equality through a legislative process. Every state that achieved marriage equality after us was because of federal court order. So really excited about this. Um, also, does not feel like 10 years, but it also feels like a lifetime, um, how time works. But, but the 10 year anniversary of marriage equality is just a big achievement. Um, but it also reminds us that these rights are under attack. And while Illinois should national marriage equality fall, Illinois would still have marriage equality in law. But what happens if you don't live in Illinois? What happens if you live in Indiana or another state that doesn't have that protection? And what happens if you are an Illinoisan who gets married or is married with your partner, but then you go to a state that doesn't recognize your marriage anymore? You lose all your rights. So that's the peril of where we are at with this U.S. Supreme Court right now and what other states are doing to challenge these rights. Um, another major piece of legislation that I, it's the one I'm proudest of in my time at Equality Illinois, but it's the bill to teach LGBTQ plus history in our public schools. We passed this bill in 2019. And, you know, for me, who 20 years ago in Springfield Public Schools never got any LGBTQ you know, plus inclusive content. This is so important, and we know what it means to have role models and to be able to reflect on a history that includes people like you and me and, and how that impacts mental health and what that means for being able to see ourselves in history and in future. And so we are one of just six states to do this. And we are the, as you can see, we're the only one in the Midwest. We're the only state. Oregon, California, Nevada, Colorado, New Jersey, the other states. Um, and I think this law is also really important because you see what Florida is doing and has done with their Don't Say LGBTQ plus bill. And this shows what we're doing in Illinois and these five other states shows that another vision of education is possible, one that is inclusive, one that affirms all students and is, presents a, a fuller view of history um, and so really excited for this legislation. Um, and so I do also want to recognize two great partners on this bill, the Legacy Project and the Illinois Safe Schools Alliance. Um, if you've ever been to the Lakeview neighborhood and walked down Halstead Street in Chicago, you've seen the plaques, or hopefully you've seen the plaques. If you haven't, please no look next time. There are plaques on rainbow pylons. That's the Legacy Project. It is a nonprofit dedicated to promoting the history of LGBTQ plus people. And it is so impactful. They're actually working right now on a new book that can be used in classrooms to help implement this, you know, the new mandate here. Um, and also, as a plug for them, they're unveiling their next two new plaques on Saturday, one of which recognizes the path to marriage equality. The other recognizes Glenn Burke, the first out uh, individual in Major League Baseball. And so, we, as we celebrate National, or National Coming Out Day and you know, LGBTQ plus history month, I'm so proud that we live in a state that tells the stories of LGBTQ plus people in public schools. Um, and like any law, implementation is gonna be fits and starts now and then, you know? But I'm proud that we've done this. But this bill only passed the Illinois House of Representatives with the bare minimum of 60 votes. So again, nothing is assured without hard work and advocacy. So we can you know, get this done, and this has been on the books now for, since 2019. The last law in Illinois I wanna mention is something that passed this year. And it is an initiative led by our Secretary of State, Alexei Giannoulias, an initiative to stop book banning in libraries. It's a very simple bill. It says that public library boards have to have a written policy opposing book banning and censorship. If they don't, they don't qualify for state grants. The Secretary of State administers about $61 million in state grants a year. Um, unfortunately, when this bill was passed, it passed on partisan margins, something that I think should be you know, a simple value of the right to read and to learn passed 
with partisan votes, with only, with only uh, Democratic votes in support of it. Um, but it's an important initiative, and I think goes to what we're seeing in a lot of you know, libraries like, right now. Not just book banning, but also bomb threats. Like bomb threats all across the suburbs, across the country. The Chicago Public Library had to be evacuated because people are calling in bomb threats. Um, just because of the right to learn, the right to read. Uh, and if you don't want your child reading a book, then don't let your child read that book. But don't take that right away from everyone, which is what we're seeing happen. Um, and we should trust our librarians. We should trust our librarian, librarians who are trained to do this work. But this is not a uniquely Illinois problem, but I'm glad to see that Illinois is leading. This is the first in the nation bill like this. So those are some of just the policy initiatives that we've been advancing um, as, a co you know, as an organization, as a coalition, and as a state the last few years. Um, also wanna just mention real quick, another priority, not so much in the policy space, but ensuring LGBTQ plus representation in positions of leadership. So that looks like making sure that when the governor appoints people to state boards and commissions like the State Board of Education or the State Banking Board or the State Forestry Council, that there are LGBTQ plus people appointed and considered and appointed for those positions. And that's important because we know that when LGBTQ plus people are seated at those tables of power where decisions are made, then policies and decisions can be more inclusive and made with the, you know, the community's interests and needs in mind. And so we've worked with the governor's office on this for a couple of years now. And you know, just to give some statistics, in fiscal year 18, so that's 2017, 2018, there were only five LGBTQ plus people who served on state boards and commissions. Only five who self-identified as serving on state boards and commissions. Out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of boards, um, Working with the governor's office, we've been able, and, and our partners across state, we've been able to, to source and recruit qualified individuals. So now there are over 70 LGBTQ plus people serving on these boards and commissions. Um, and again, that's important because it's important to have those voices of leadership at those tables. We've also worked um, on legislation to require corporations to report out board diversity as well. Um, on, you know, working, uh, working with the legislature. And we're working now on a, a legislation to require that nonprofit boards also do the same, um, to show that those boards reflect the diversity of the communities they serve, um, and also to, to demonstrate to potential talent that that organization supports and affirms them and welcomes their full self to the table. And so we're excited about these, you know, initiatives in the private sector, the public sector, and the, you know, hopefully the nonprofit sector in the coming year. Um, also, Illinois has seen an, uh, a real growth of LGBTQ plus elected officials. 64, at least according to my count, and this is probably more, but at least 64 individuals are LGBTQ plus serving in elected office in Illinois. And most of those individuals have won election at the local level city councils, county boards, school boards, library boards. Um, we now have, within the last four or five years, seven trans folks elected to office in Illinois, including just this last, um, just this last April, the first trans person elected to a city council, elected in Carbondale, Illinois, which I love, because you know, some members of the Chicago news media were, were like, Carbondale in Southern Illinois electing the first trans person to a city council, but to me, if you knew the organizing that had been happening in Carbondale and the, the amazing community organizations, the Rainbow Cafe, it wouldn't be a surprise. There's so much good stuff happening. And the flip side of this is there's only one LGBTQ plus member of the legislature in the Illinois House who's L, you know, LGBTQ, and there's only one LGBTQ plus state senator. So we gotta do more. And if this is actually the appropriate time that if you wanna run for office, this is the time to do it. Uh, to get your petitions out there and to do that and to, to be more engaged in, in public service. But having said all of that, all those great laws, all that great work, all this great representation, we still have more work to do. And we just at Equality Illinois adopted a new strategic plan. Um, and that strategic plan for the next five years was informed based on what we heard directly from LGBTQ plus people across the state. 
through surveys, through town halls, through a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations. And our, you know, our CEO and our deputy director and our board distilled those into a, a plan. And so what we heard informs our policy work going forward in Illinois and how Illinois will keep moving forward, keep moving the ball, keep being creative. Um, and part of that also is recognizing the, as I mentioned, the increasing violence against LGBTQ plus people and trans folks in particular, um, the increasing gun violence. Um, you know, last year there was the mass shooting at the nightclub in Colorado. Um, this is also why you'll see Equality Illinois supporting initiatives for gun violence prevention. Um, but what we also heard from members of our community across the state, our CEO always likes to ask, what makes you proud to be LGBTQ plus in Illinois? But where does it still hurt? Where is the pain? And we heard about um, inequalities in the criminal legal system, inequalities in accessing affirming health care, and economic injustices, economic inequalities. And what that looks like in the criminal legal system. LG, LGBTQ people are six times more likely to be stopped by the police than members of the general population. Six times more likely to be stopped by the police. Lesbian, gay, and bisexual people are three times more likely to be incarcerated than members of the general population. And 13% of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer people and 56% of trans folks do not call the police when they need help. And LGBT people are nearly four times more likely to experience violent victimization than non-LGBT people. We also hear stories of, of the, the use of solitary confinement against trans folks in the, criminal, in the, in the correctional system. Um, you know, the criminalization of, of sex workers, which disproportionately harms you know, um, LGBTQ plus folks, particularly trans folks, trans women of color. So these are what we heard, you know, and the concerns that are still coming in a state like Illinois. You know, economic inequalities. LGBTQ plus people ex disproportionately experience the harms of economic inequality. The Midwest has the highest percentage of queer people living in poverty. And 25%, at least 25% of LGBT people in Illinois experience poverty. It's even higher for trans folks. And so this is why we will proudly support initiatives like raising the state's minimum wage or pursuing paid family and medical leave. Because we know that when you pass policies like that, because of the disproportionate harm of economic inequality, those policies will disproportionately support LGBTQ plus people, workers, and families. Um, and healthcare, uh, reporting higher rates of illness and fear mis of mistreatment by medical providers. 24% of trans folks in Illinois do not go to the doctor when they need to because they're afraid of how to be treated. They don't go seek basic preventative health care because they're afraid of how they'll be treated. I remember a few years ago, we heard a story of a, um, uh, a trans youth in Carbondale who told us that when they seek health care, they go to Howard Brown Health, traveling five hours by car or train just to the north side of Chicago just to access a primary care physician who supports and affirms them. And so, what we do is we look at these concerns and issues and, um, and harms that our community is telling us about. We build coalitions and we look for policy solutions. And for instance, one this year that I'm really, really excited about is the Healthcare Cultural Competency Act that we passed here in Illinois. One of the few states to have a law like this where now, thanks to the great coalition that advanced this and our sponsors, now when a doctor or a nurse or a social worker or a psychologist or a podiatrist or a dentist or any ra a range of health providers, when they have to renew their license in Illinois, they have to include as part of their continuing education cultural competency. I'm just really excited about this bill because this goes to what that trans youth told us in Carbondale about having to travel five hours for basic medical care. And it goes to what 24% of trans folks report about not going to the doctor because of fear of mistreatment. Having some basic education um, and, and really excited about this initiative and when it takes effect in 25, 
um, what we can do with this, what our partners can do with this as well. So just an example of how we take the harms our community tells us they are feeling and turn it into policy action. Um, and I, I talk about that, but also remembering that we are not alone. Illinois is not its own country. We are a, part of a 50 state, you know, the United States, and you can't clean your part of the pool only. You only can't clean your part of the pool. And what that means is that while we keep working on offense here and keep moving the ball forward, with creative solutions to advancing LGBTQ plus equality and justice, we also have to help support organizations in other states doing the same work, um, you know, fighting back, organizing against anti-LGBTQ laws. Um, a few weeks ago, we helped co-host a fundraiser for Equality Florida. And one of the things that the leaders of Equality Florida said is, um, everything we do in Illinois acts as an antidote to all the claims made by anti-LGBTQ politicians in states like Florida. Well, you can't teach sex ed because this will happen. This evil thing will happen. You can't teach LGBTQ inclusive history. You can't, make, you can't let trans kids have access to gender-affirming care. But what we do in Illinois proves them wrong, pushes back against the disinformation, and shows that a better world is possible. And when states like Florida turn that corner they can look to Illinois and states like Illinois as a model for what progress could be. So you can't only clean your part of the pool. And so we've got to play offense and defense at the same time and support partners in Texas, Missouri, Florida, states like that. Um, and so I think that begs the question, what is next? What is next for Illinois? And so, I left this slide blank because I'm gonna tell you what's next. Three things in particular that, that we are focused on. One, we have these great laws, but now the legislature has to fund these priorities. That means putting money behind inclusive education, putting money behind the infrastructure to serve the needs of Illinoisans and people who are coming to Illinois seeking health care. So we are working with partners across the state to identify what those fiscal priorities are. And you, bet, you better believe it, we're gonna to go to the legislature early next year when they're making their budget, and we're gonna say you need to fund priorities to support LGBTQ plus people in Illinois. So funding from the state budget is a priority. Earlier I mentioned the state's new standards for personal health and safety education and sexual health education. Great new robust standards that are age appropriate can't say that enough, age appropriate, medically accurate and inclusive. Just one problem, school districts don't have to teach them if they don't want to. And so the State Board of Education published data in August, 72% of school districts in Illinois are not teaching comprehensive sexual health education and comprehensive personal health and safety education. 72% of school districts in Illinois. So we're gonna continue fighting with our partners like Planned Parenthood to ensure that we get to a place and pass legislation to require that public schools teach age appropriate, medically accurate, and inclusive sexual health education and personal health and safety education. That's a big priority for us um, and would love all of your engagement on that because that is a campaign that is gonna be ha rolling out and working soon. And then <clears throat> the, third, um, the third educational campaign we're working on and I mentioned a little bit about this a second ago, is how can we in Illinois keep sex workers safe? Um, the criminalization of sex work disproportionately impacts trans folks, particularly trans women of color. Uh, and we at Equality Illinois have been guided by uh, an advisory group of, of, of current and former sex workers these last few years about how can we keep sex workers safe in Illinois and you know, um, ensure true safety um, and, and and the criminalization of sex work. So we are looking into that, we are building an education campaign, we have been focused on that at all the Pride Festivals over the summer. Um, and so those are our three priorities um, as we go forward. Um, and again, showing that Illinois is continuing to move forward, continuing to be robust in our protections, and, um, and, and leading the way in the Midwest. Um, and I wanna end with how you can help be part of that. Because um, 
Equality in Illinois, we don't do it alone. I don't do it alone. Um, but you all have a voice. And I have seen advocates go to the state capitol, tell your, their stories, and I've seen legislators move their votes from no to yes because they heard personal stories and heard that human connection. Um, your story is your power, and no one can tell you your story is wrong because it's you, it's your experience. They can argue with me about data, and I'm happy to have those conversations with legislators, but they can't argue with you about your personal experiences and why you care about LGBTQ plus history in schools or why you care about teaching inclusive sexual health education or why you care about decriminalizing HIV or LGBTQ older adults or why you care about the rights of refugees or environmental protections or mitigating climate change or protecting reproductive rights. That's your story and you have such power and legislators love the human connection. So I just, none of this progress happens without all of us pushing together. And together it's how we keep this state moving forward to keep being a, a refuge and a haven for those from other states and for Illinoisans as well. Um, so telling your story, advocating, advocating on campus, advocating to your library board, um, advocating to your school board, um, advocating to your state representative and your state senator, um, advocating to your member of Congress, telling your stories why you support something. Um, and also, none of this progress also would have happened without good pro-equality people in office. The legislature has two super majorities in the House and Senate right now, the Democrats do, and those majorities are made up of folks who care about LGBTQ plus people, who care about justice, who care about inclusion, who care about equality. And so it takes all of us voting, and voting, uh, to be clear, is not the, it doesn't solve every, all the problems in the world, but to get good policies, you have to have good people in office. And you have to elect them and show up. And then once they're elected, you have to hold them accountable. You have to go to them and tell them your story and ask them to make hard votes. Ask them to, to pursue a path of equality and justice. So this is how you can engage to build a better world. Tell your story, advocate, you know, exercise your right to vote in the electoral process, um, but also other ways engage in marches and rallies and protests, you know, time-honored American traditions of engagement. Um, because one of the things that we also heard from our partners around the state when we built our strategic plan is a real concern for the fate of democracy, a real fear about where democracy is headed. Um, and so we push back on that by exercising our authority and exercising our rights. And so you have a lot of power. You have a lot of power to make change. Um, and I can't do it alone, and I've never been able to do it alone, and I don't want to do it alone. I'd love to see you all at Advocacy Days at the Capitol to help build that better world. Um, and also, I just want to put this slide on here, because we at Equality Network don't do this work alone. We've got a lot of amazing partners across the state, LGBTQ plus organizations who do this work as well. I just wanted to recognize, I'm not gonna name them all, but you can see them all, recognize who they are and the work they do, um, including Elmhurst Pride Collective, uh, but also Youth Outlook, who I know is active in Elmhurst and Naperville and other communities doing great direct services for LGBTQ plus youth. So um, this is all why I'm optimistic. I know it's a scary time. I said more than 400 anti-LGBTQ bills being introduced, but it's because of partners like these groups why I'm optimistic about the work in Illinois in being able to move forward. We are a beautiful constellation of community organizations, and we can get this done. And LGBTQ plus folks have shown that we can build our own world when we have to against violence and discrimination. So. Thank you so much for letting me be with you today, and um, I think I'm happy to answer any questions as well.
thank you so much. And all of you that are here, uh, we're inviting anyone who would like to ask a question. <laughs> I'm doing this one. Oh, okay, try this again. <laughs> thank you for coming. Um, anyone who would like to ask a question, please come to the microphone. You may have noticed we have a um, camera set up over here. The um, local TV station, some aspect of it, is filming this and it's going to be shared on the public television uh, YouTube outlets, et cetera, here in the Elmhurst community. So um, this way they can hear your questions. We can't walk around with the mic today like we usually do. So please come here. Okay. Any brave soul want to start this conversation? No. I couldn't possibly have done that good a job. <laughs> you did it. You did an excellent job. Um, any questions, comments? Um, we can start the question. Okay, okay, thanks, Jeff. Kick us off. So you mentioned earlier that we're seeing all of these uh, LGBTQ folks moving from other states into Illinois, right? And uh, we're doing so much to help, uh, you know, the people of Illinois and these new transplants. But what I think it would be great if we could hear a little bit more about what we could do to help folks you know, in Florida or other places where, you know, in, in some ways, it's their goal to get these people to leave and to move out. So how do we, how do we support the folks who, who yeah. stay? I mean, the question is, um, how can we support folks in other states that are fighting back and organizing against these anti-LGBTQ policies and politicians? Um, one way, donations. You know, make a five dollars, ten dollars goes a long way if you have that capacity. Um, and I think also, if you have friends in, who live in those states, talking to them about what's happening, um, because you know, folks are busy. They may not know what's happening, uh, and they're not all professional policy directors who think about this stuff all the time like I do. Too much thinking about it. But like, talk to your friends in those states. Um, help support those organizations. And sometimes those states also will do campaign efforts where they will link you with voters in those states to call those voters to encourage them to take a particular position of support or, or something on initiatives to help engage the communities there. Um, but folks shouldn't have to leave their home state. They shouldn't have to leave their home state. And not everyone can for financial reasons or for other reasons. Um, so folks shouldn't have to. Now, I'm glad Illinois is, is passing, we're, that we're passing great laws to protect folks coming here. Um, but not everyone will move here, nor should they have to. And so, yeah, things like donations, um, you know, some organizations, I know um, um, a great organization uh, in Buffalo Grove, Buffalo Grove Pride, facilitates letter writing campaigns to send postcards to LGBTQ folks in other states just to let them know they're loved and supported. Because honestly, if you like turn on the news in Florida, it's a lot of like awful anti-LGBTQ stuff happening at the school boards, book bans, um, you know, at the legislative level, at the, what, the, what Governor DeSantis is doing, Texas as well, uh, Missouri. Um, and it's, it's cruel and it's vicious. So there's just a variety of ways to, to engage like that. Um, you know, if you can make a donation, if you can help with those letter writing campaigns, you know, also something as simple as following that state's equality group. So following Equality Florida on Twitter, on Snapchat, on Instagram, um, you know, following Equality Texas, following these organizations. There's, there's generally an equality organization in every state, except for a few, but following them and seeing what they say. Um, one thing we always do is whenever a situation occurs, we always, instead of just assuming, oh, we should ban travel to that state, we turn to our partner there, like Equality Florida. What do you think is the best course of action? What do you want? Because sometimes a boycott may actually harm the people that most need support. So you always want to turn and look at those organizations and see what they say they want. So um, it's a long answer to your question. But yeah, start. I would start by following those organizations, like Equality Texas, Equality Florida. If you want a list, look at the Equality Federation website. The Equality Federation is like a an association of state LGBTQ organizations. So and there's a lot of cool organizations out there doing really cool work across the country. Yeah. 
So firstly, thank you for your lecture. It was amazing, interesting, everything. And you mentioned some of the solutions to raise awareness about LGBTQ plus people. Uh, there's rallies, you said, marches, everything. And yes, they would definitely help to raise awareness in the US. But as far as I know, in the third world countries, the, this problem is way bigger. So what solutions do you think can we as humans accomplish and like do mm -hmm. to raise awareness in the countries not in the US? Yeah, Thank that's you. a great question. And one to which I don't have an easy answer, um, since I primarily do look at state policy issues, not even so much federal. Uh, but, but there are a lot of great organizations um, that are doing work in other states. Um, and I, of course, this is the moment I went blank on all their names. But there are some great organizations, um, international LGBTQ rights organizations, um, to, to just follow them and check out what they recommend um, and see how supportive they are. Um, I think also giving to groups and supporting groups um, like the National Immigrant Justice Center, which has a, a pretty strong LGBTQ plus um, legal division um, to supporting individuals who come to the United States seeking refuge and, and who are LGBTQ. Um, so I think looking at the National Immigrant Justice Center, um, but also looking up some of those organizations that are active internationally um, and seeing directly what the, they recommend because you, you know, um, you want to be sure that what you're doing is actually going to be helping and not causing, causing harm. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, I, my, my, my days of like deep foreign policy engagement are like behind, you know, years behind me, but um, I always, always suggestion for, always recommendation for everything is go to the organizations that are already doing the work and seeing what they say. So I think, um, um, looking, uh, and I'm just trying to think, there's one in particular, but I can't remember the name, so I apologize. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Hi, again, thank you for being here. Um, so going a little back, because oh, I'm not too sure, so I know you mentioned October being kind of like the history mm -hmm. month, and uh, or it holds the aspect of history and everything. What would, what does June hold in of itself, that yeah. June itself is like the Pride Month, yeah. and October is like history. Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Um, I am gonna say, I don't know why October is History Month, and that is on me, and I should know that. Um, but June is Pride Month in recognition of the Stonewall Riots, which occurred at the end of June in 1969 um, uh, in New York City. Um, and so that is why, you know, June is Pride Month, um, pretty much globally recognized. There's usually Pride festivals in, in, in major cities around the world in June, not, not exclusively. Um, and then what happened also in 1970 was the first Pride parades to commemorate, you know, the Stonewall riot in 1969. And little trivia fact, again, we all think of Pride parade starting in New York and San Francisco. But actually, the first Pride parade was in Chicago, and we beat those other cities by one day. So, um, you know, another little bit of interesting trivia. But yeah, so that's, that's why June, you know, is um, symbolically Pride Month. So I will also say queer people exist the other 11 months as well. So we often get asked in June for you know, oh, would you come and lecture? Will you, will you come and uh, speak at our corporate retreat or something? And it's like, sure, but you know we're LGBTQ plus the other 11 months too, right? You don't have to pack everything into one month. Um, but we're glad you're at least thinking about it. <laughs> so, but it's a great question, thank you. And now I have to figure out why October is History Month. That's on me. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, thank you for your lecture. Um, I was particularly struck by the story you shared about the trans person from Southern Illinois mm -hmm. that had to travel so far upstate uh, to receive adequate health care. What are the, I guess, challenges that exist in Southern Illinois, particularly and across the state as a whole, that are preventing them from uh, receiving the care where they are? Yeah, I mean, part of it is a lack of culturally competent care, a lack of awareness and education on the part of health care providers which is why we worked on the legislation this year. Um, I mean, the other part of it is, um, there, could other, there could be other reasons, financial barriers to care. Um, 
one other bill that we worked on to help reduce some of those barriers is, are you all familiar with what PrEP is? Pre-exposure prophylaxis. So it is a, um, it's a treatment um, regimen, including a pill, taken once a day, is really, it's like near 100% not effective um, in preventing the transmission of HIV. So you take it daily and it will prevent the infection of HIV. Um, and so what hap what, what's happened is it's, you know, this wonderful treatment, um, but the communities most in need, who are most being impacted by HIV, are not getting access to it. So we worked on, um, with the AIDS Foundation in Chicago, uh, legislation last year to allow pharmacists to dispense PrEP and PEP, um, which I'll explain what PEP is in a second, but PrEP and PEP without a prescription. So no longer would a person have to go to a doctor um, and, you know, uh, to access, um, uh, you know, the, this, this, this medical care. If you go to a pharmacist, you can dispense it without, um, without a prescription. Uh, and that's a big deal because, you know, you think about the data I mentioned earlier about, you know, just the number of trans folks you don't want to the doctor. Well, now you can act, you'll be able to access PrEP at a pharmacist without going to a doctor. Um, and so reducing barriers like that. Um, another... Um, a barrier that we helped that was reduced this year is uh, a bill we worked on for birth certificates. Before July of this year, uh, an individual who wanted to correct the gender marker on their birth certificate would have to go to a doctor and get a doctor's note saying that person had undergone clinically appropriate treatment for gender transition and should be able to correct the gender marker on their birth certificate. It's a barrier for the reasons I mentioned. It's a barrier, um, and it's it's driver's licenses, social security. Passports do not require a doctor's note. So we um, worked on legislation to get rid of the doctor's note for birth certificates. So now, as of July 1st of this year, an individual just fills out the, the proper form with their $15, I think, and then mails it to the Department of Public Health in Springfield. And then the department will send the, the uh, corrected birth certificate back. So removing those barriers, um, which, um, you know, which, which help folks lead more authentic lives without, you know, those societal constructs in their way. So just a few of the things, a um, few of the barriers, um, identity documents, you know, not having to go to a provider for preventative care, um, and that cultural competency as well. We're always, you know, partnering with other organizations about, uh, particularly AIDS Foundation Chicago, about and Howard Brown Health and other partners, Rainbow Cafe and Carbondale, like, what are other ways we can remove barriers, reduce barriers, and just make life better for folks. So, good question, thank you. On the topic of kind of removing those barriers, you mentioned earlier that a lot of other states that aren't as inclusive and accepting um, have suggestions or their ideas of like with um, trans-effective like medical care, that that will create negative situations in their states and their communities when we're disproving that. Is there any other way that we can help kind of change that mindset um, on like an individual level? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, as kind of what I mentioned, like change happens person to person with stories, but also arming yourself with the truth arming yourself with the facts and being able to push back when you hear these arguments. You know, if you hear these arguments about the harms of gender affirming care, you know, like pushing back, being able to articulate against that. Um, because there are folks in Illinois who have introduced legislation to ban gender affirming care for youth. Uh, and Florida has actually gone further. Florida has not only banned it for young people, Florida has also by and large banned gender affirming care for adults as well. Um, so talk about intervening between a patient, their family, and a doctor. That's what's happening there. Um, but I think, you know, following and getting the truth from organizations, there's great organizations like the National Center for Transgender Equality, um, but also, you know, groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics or the American Medical Association. Um, so just knowing information and being able to push back um, on it is so, so powerful um, because 
you know, disinformation spreads so easily if nobody's there to check it with the truth. Thank you. One last question. It's one of the faculty members here. Um, at an educational institution, you're giving us a lot of good information. We really appreciate that. And you talked about, you know, Gay History Month. Where else can we go to get information besides our wonderful librarians who are tremendous here? Uh, where would you recommend we go to get the accurate information you just spoke mm -hmm. about or the historical information that we don't know? Yeah. So, uh, great question. On history, um, I recommend looking up the Legacy Project. Um, it's that uh, LGBTQ uh, history nonprofit based in uh, Chicago in uh, um, the North Halstead area. Um, and what they also really cool, and maybe this is something you'll want to do at Elmhurst University someday, not only do they have the, the streetscape on Halstead in Chicago, the pylons and the plaques, but they also have a traveling exhibit called the Legacy Wall, which I think right now is at Illinois Central College in Pe East Peoria. But that might be kind of cool to get on campus someday. Um, and it has panels that detail that history, individuals in history, events in history, and, and you know, what that means um, for LGBTQ plus history and American history. Um, so I recommend really the Legacy Project um, for history, like looking at that, um, going first. Another great organization in Chicago is the Gerber Hart Library um, in the, um, I believe it's the Edge Rogers Park, Edgewater neighborhood. Uh, and the Gerber Hart Library is the Midwest's largest library and collection dedicated to LGBTQ plus history. Um, and so I recommend checking Gerber Hart Library out. Uh, and it's named for Henry Gerber, who was the founder of the first gay rights organization in the United States, the Society for Human Rights. So for history, Legacy Project, and the Gerber Hart Library and Museum. Um, for other organizations, you know, um, I recommend also following national partners, the National Center for Transgender Equality, um, Transgender Law Center, National Center for Lesbian Rights, um, oh, <clears throat> the Equality Federation. Love the Equality Federation. We're also one of the founding members. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a, like I said, it's an association of state LGBTQ plus organizations. Um, so you can really get a lot of information about what different states are working on and experiencing. Um, those are just a few ideas. I could go on and on and on, but I'm going to stop there because those are all good recommendations. You're welcome. Any last questions or? Well, I think we're going to let our speaker wrap this up. Will you <laughs> join me in um, thanking him uh, once again? And we certainly have a lot to think about thanks to him and uh, the information he shared and where we can all go from here, right here at Elmhurst on this issue. So thank you so much, Mike. Thank you.